if you were stuck in a blizzard with a horde of deadly Christmas creatures hunting you down, what would you do? I'm going to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the evil Santa Claus in Krampus. This family is about to be punished by a demon. The Angles here are getting ready for their big pre-Christmas dinner and making sure they have everything they need for their giant feast. The father, Tom, receives a call from his co-worker and tells him that he has to work over the big day. The son, Max, asks his parents if they're not going to wrap Christmas presents, but Tom here tells him to do it alone before their cousins arrive. The others leave the kid by himself and he walks over to his grandma, Omi, while icing his face. She asks him in German if he's finished the letter and the kid admits that he started but can't think of what to wish for this Christmas. Meanwhile, the mother, Sarah, hangs up her family photo, but notices that Santa Claus here is looking away. The boy asks his grandmother if she still believes in Santa. She responds by saying that believing in him is the spirit of the holiday before she whips out a dessert for the kid to eat. Later, the strange cousins arrive and bring in a heap of gifts for the family. Howard here drops his gifts on the ground and confesses that he brought their dog along. Max here tries to strike up a conversation with his cousin, but the other boy just stares at him before walking away. That's when Aunt Dorothy walks in, complaining that the family didn't clear the ice in the walkway and scolding Sarah for not checking up on her before asking where the egg dog is. Tom here questions if there are more people coming, and the family realizes they left the baby in the car. The men leave to get her, and Sarah complains about the appearance of their aunt. Linda admits that she was forced to bring her along while the men return with the baby. At dinner, Howard's son gulps down a soft drink, burping out loud. The father congratulates his son and questions if Tom here ever played sports in school. He responds by saying that his time was occupied by being in the scouts, and Howard makes fun of them in front of the entire table. The cousins question Max on what he's wished for this year, and whip out the private letter that he wrote to Santa. They read out loud that Max wishes he could hang out with his sister more, admitting he hasn't got many friends. Next, they read that he wishes his parents could stop fighting so much and rekindled their love. Lastly, the cousins see a wish directed to Howard and Linda, worried for their situation and praying for their success in the new year. That's when Sarah walks in with the creme brulee, and Max here lunges at his cousins, demanding they give back his wish list. The kids begin fighting before Max is thrown down to the floor, and they're broken up. Furious, he freaks out and confesses that he hates his entire family before storming off. Later, Tom visits his son to tell him that the family is only here for three days and they need to get along until they leave, but he's not entirely sure why. Max questions if he believes in the Christmas spirit, but the man urges his son to drop his wish list in the mailbox. That's when he leaves, and Max here packs his finished letter for Santa into an envelope, but he's about to make his biggest mistake. Unhappy with it, he takes the note out and rips it up before throwing the scraps out his window with no idea he's just cursed his family. The next morning, the family wakes up to find that their power has been cut off, and Tom insists that they stay calm, but when he checks their home phone, he discovers it's not working. Max tells his parents that he found a snowman in the yard and takes them over to the window to show them, questioning who built it. Confused, Tom suggests that there might be other people still around, but his wife shuts him down, mentioning that every family in the area is out on vacation. Hearing a knock, Linda here offers to open the door and finds a delivery driver on the porch with a bunch of parcels. She signs off on the packages, commenting on the weather, and the delivery driver tells her there are some other gifts left outside their door, but this is the first sign that something is going to go seriously wrong. Okay, this Christmas is about to go sour like eggnog in February. First of all, everyone knows Santa isn't real, but when you're a kid, this is heartbreaking news. We can't blame Max here for taking it badly, but there's more going on here than meets the eye. He had good wishes for nearly everyone seated at the table, and it was really heartwarming but they treated him horribly for the entire night. With all things considered, ripping out this letter to Santa makes a lot of sense, but he'll soon find out it was a huge mistake. When you reject faith in a supernatural entity, only for crazy magical shit to happen immediately afterwards, we should be extremely worried. These papers got sucked up into the sky, and if this happened to you, there's no way you'd be mistaking it as a gust of wind. As soon as the kid saw this, he should have known something bad would follow, and when the entire neighborhood went into a deep frost, it should have confirmed it. It's terrifying, and that's why if it were me, I would tell my family everything that happened and start researching mythical folklore and Santa Claus as quickly as possible. If he does exist, then there must be information on him from ancient stories around the world, and it wouldn't take long to find what we're looking for. This grandma also is behaving like she knows more than she's letting on, so I would talk to her to see if she has any information about what's happening. This one simple step could prepare us for the worst, and soon he'll regret not taking this seriously. Now with that said, having your entire extended family at your house is bad enough, but there are some things the Angle family can do to to help weather the storm and power outage. It's best to prepare for situations like this by buying a backup generator and stocking the house with flashlights, batteries, and extra food supplies. This mom is a control freak, 
so she should have gone out of her way to do these things already, but even if she hasn't, there are certain steps they can still take to survive for as long as possible. First, I would block the drafts. That means that any and all leaks and gaps in windows and doorways where cold air can get through need to be closed off with rags, towels, or anything else I can find to create a temporary seal. By blocking these locations, this ensures that heat gets trapped inside the house. This will help the family go a considerably longer time without electricity. The other thing I would do is start breaking down furniture to use as firework. The family has a fireplace in their living room, and keeping the fire burning at all times will warm the family, as well as keep the house temperature up which will help the pipes from freezing. At this point, it would also be a good idea to turn off the main water valve in case pipes burst. That way the amount of water that comes flowing out will be less. In the case that the pipes do burst, then there will be less trapped cold water that will freeze and bring down the temperature of the house overall. Once the family's home is secure from the freezing temperatures, I would check the food and water supply. Any perishable items that will go bad, I would move to the freezer. Although the refrigerator needs electricity to run, cold air will still be trapped in it. The freezer will stay the coldest for longer and will be the best place to keep essentials. Anything that will go bad but has the potential to be saved by cooking, I would cook immediately. Hard boiling items like eggs over the fire will help maximize both my storage space and the amount of food that will stay fresh. Picking up the parcels, the cousins walk inside while Beth mentions that her boyfriend hasn't written back to her recently. She asks to walk over and check on him, but her mother insists that she stay put. Tom allows her to go for an hour, and she leaves her house to face the extreme weather. Outside, she walks in the blizzard, but is confused as to where she's going. That's when the clouds begin to darken, and she spots this worn down house covered in ice. Suddenly, a gigantic beast jumps from house to house, and the girl is terrified. She runs away as fast as she can, but the creature won't stop chasing her. Beth arrives at this delivery truck and tries opening the door to find that it's locked. She rubs the window and realizes that the man inside has been frozen alive. Shocked, she hides under the truck while hearing the creature making loud ominous noises. Looking around, the monster lands right in front of her as Beth covers her mouth. It's the scariest thing that she's ever seen, and it's going to be the last. Beth finds a music box where the creature was standing, and it opens up to reveal a horrifying sight. That makes one family member down with 11 more to go. That night, the parents wait for Beth, and Tom here comments that there hasn't been a single person on the street since this morning. Worried about her daughter, Tom insists that she's alright and tells his wife to calm down. Max interrupts to ask where his sister went since the sun is about to go down, and she's not back. Tom informs the cousins that Beth has gone missing, and they're going to take a quick trip around town to look for her. The grandmother gets up, insisting that the family stay home, and Max translates for her, explaining that she wants them to wait until the storm is over to go look for their daughter. Now realizing that the grandmother is trying to help them, Tom leaves her in the care of his cousins and heads outside with Howard. They drive through the massive blizzard, wondering why the radio isn't working, but that's when they spot a snowplow in the distance and get out of the truck to see if anyone's stuck outside. The men check inside of the vehicle and spot gifts spread around the interior. They also notice that the kid has been left the ignition and point their flashlights towards a broken window. Tom comments that the glass has been punched in, and that means the driver didn't fly through the windshield. They spot the same frozen house and realize that it's time to look for Beth. It might look like an innocent rundown property, but it's about to get extremely terrifying. Okay, so things are starting to get weird. Not only is the storm worsening, but radios and cell phones don't seem to be working either. The daughter has gone missing even when her boyfriend only lives a couple blocks away, and now they've just discovered a nearby truck has been broken into. The men have decided to look for Beth, but there are no signs of life anywhere to be found, and the whole situation is incredibly suspicious. We need more information to figure out what the hell is going on, and that's why if it were me, I would do everything I could to first make contact with the outside world. It's weird that the entire town has gone missing, and it's a major red flag that we can't contact anyone for help. Even though I want to find my daughter, for all we know the girl might be severely injured and we have no way of contacting emergency services for help. We also can't be sure she hasn't entered one of these houses to get out of the storm for some reason, so quickly checking on each residence as we pass by is going to give us a better chance of finding her. If we're lucky, we might discover another family is trapped in the storm with us and we can share resources, keeping each other safer until we find out more. As extreme as it sounds, I would also start breaking into cars and empty houses to see if I can trigger an alarm system. This this is a wealthy neighborhood, so it's fair to assume that any cars left stranded here are going to have alarm. If I'm able to set one off, the sound will draw attention to me and will allow any other people to know where I am. I would also look for different houses with alarms to break into. Even though the power is out, some alarm systems still work without the electricity, or if the house has a backup battery. Once the house alarm goes off, that will hopefully draw the cops out into our area, and once they are there, I will have them help me find my daughter and also bring my family to safety. If this doesn't work, and all the alarm services have been mysteriously disarmed, I would start foraging for supplies in different cars and houses. The most useful item would be to find a backup generator so I can get the electricity and internet working in my house. That way I can contact help and have someone come to collect us in an emergency vehicle. In addition to trying to set off alarms, I would also collect any non-
non-perishable food supplies and medical supplies. The medical supplies are the most important right now in case we find Beth and she needs help. Once I have all the supplies I need to help survive in the long term stored back in the car, I would then proceed to go out searching for my daughter if I haven't already found her as I pick through houses on the street. Now, Max here was being quite an idiot. As I said before, if you see all this happening as soon as you've rejected faith in the supernatural, we can't ignore that it might be a little bit our fault. Even if you think it's just superstition, keeping this a secret is putting your family at risk because in the smallest chance that they're facing supernatural threats when they go outside, they won't be prepared for it. The men are armed with guns, but this would give them a false sense of security because these weapons will be almost meaningless if they have to shoot down the ghost of Christmas past. It's just not going to work. And that's why I would have insisted they listen to what happened and take it seriously. We can expect they won't believe us, but if they encounter something that's unnatural, they will already have the information we gave them and they'll be able to adjust their thinking much more quickly, saving their lives. The men get their weapons ready, opening the door and pointing their flashlights around the ruined house. Howard here finds a knife planted in the fridge door and comments that something here has gone terribly wrong. That's when he notices a hole in the wall, suggesting that a gas flame might have blown out and caused the house to freeze over. They find these footmarks on the snowy floor, with Howard telling him that they're hooves. An animal has been inside here, but Tom questions what kind of creature with hooves can walk on its hind legs. Suddenly, they hear Beth screaming for her life and rush outside to see where she is. Walking through the blizzard, Howard is taken away by an invisible creature and pulled into the snow like it's quicksand. Tom grabs his hand but struggles to pull the man's body out. Howard tells him that something is biting him, but that that's when he pulls out his revolver and shoots at the creature. Watching as it escapes, Tom grabs his brother-in-law and walks him back to the car, finding that their vehicle has caught in fire. Meanwhile, Sarah here gets ready to leave her house, worried about the men's safety. They come rushing inside, and Tom demands that they make room. He insists that everyone stay in the house and stay away from the windows. Sarah notices that the man has been bit and calls for the younger ones to head into the kitchen. Tom tells the grandmother to follow the others, but she slowly turns her head and warns him to keep the fireplace hot. She knows something that they don't, and he's about to find out. Later, they patch up Howard's wound and Sarah here asks Tom about their daughter. He confesses that they couldn't find Beth at her boyfriend's house, causing his wife to break down, and she demands they all head outside. Howard refuses, telling her that it's dangerously cold and all the other houses have been wrecked. Tom checks the fireplace and asks his brother-in-law how much ammunition he has left. He suggests they board up all the doors and windows, making the house safe from any future attacks. Sarah questions what they'll tell the kids, but they walk in before she can prepare an excuse. Now the kids know that Beth has been taken by a monster, and it's terrifying. Later, Sarah prepares beddings for the night, and Linda here insists that her daughter is safe. The men finish up fixing the barricades, and Howard tells his brother-in-law that he's thankful for helping him out back there, mentioning that he's not as spineless as he thought. Max shows up, asking his dad if they're going to die. He mentions that the grandmother hasn't been the same since the storm began. That reminds his father that she's always strange around this time of the year, and he doesn't know why, but they're all about to find out. Okay, everyone in this town is gone, the daughter is still missing, and Howard has been bitten by something huge. This is not good, and is bound to get way worse based on the speed and the size of the creature that attacked him. In order to keep the family safe, Tom needs to take the information he's collected on the beast to try to repel it. Based on the fact that there were hoof markings in the snow, and the creature used its teeth to attack Howard, we have good reason to think that this is some kind of wild animal that's hunting in the area, which means that we can take what we know about large animal attacks and apply it here to try to scare it away. Grandma here has already alluded to the fact that we need to keep the fire burning and we should use this information to reinforce our theory to keep an advantage. Most wild animals are scared of fire and stay away from it when they see a campfire burning. And since we already know that the houses on the street are empty, I would try to light the house across the street on fire. It might sound insane because we still don't know enough about what's going on and the consequences here would obviously be crippling. If anyone knew we were lighting neighbors' houses on fire, we would get slapped with arson charges and all these kids would become orphans. We don't have enough information to warrant using tactics this extreme but this is exactly why I would only suggest this strategy to my brother-in-law. This man's entire family has been bullying us since they arrived, and has turned almost every point of the dinner conversation about his right to bear arms. The man literally packed cases of weapons in the back of his car on a family Christmas vacation to the suburbs, so it would be difficult to convince him that firepower is what we need in this situation. If we can make him take all of the risks onto himself, we can use better strategies to handle this beast without getting ourselves in trouble, and it's a win-win. The house across the street is the ideal house to set ablaze, because it's close enough that it will keep the beast away from us, but it's far enough away that the fire won't cross the 
pavement. I would first light a torch and wave it around to repel the animal as I crossed the street. Then, I would siphon out gas from a broken down neighboring car. I would then break into the house through the window and break down furniture to light on fire. If the beast comes to get me in the time that I'm doing this, I would try to light its fur on fire. Once the house is on fire, I would return to my own house and use extra animal proofing to keep it away. Large animals like bears are also repelled by loud noises and smells like bleach and ammonia. I would take these chemicals and surround my house with it, as well as bang loud pots and pans whenever I think the creature is nearby. No matter what, I would also attack instead of run. Tom has already had one run-in with the beast and survived it because he chose to fire his gun instead of turning and run. Trying to outrun predators like bears instead of scanning your ground usually gives them more incentive to hunt you down. Giving him a hug, Tom sees Max off to sleep while they continue to keep a lookout. Howard suggests that they take turns keeping watch, with him deciding to take the first shift. Later, the family is sleeping peacefully and have no idea that the monster is about to strike. The fireplace is extinguished, and now they've made a big mistake, as a hook is sent down the chimney with a gingerbread man attached to it. The quiet kid Howie wakes up and notices the tree dangling from the fireplace. Walking over, he decides to take it for himself. The kid bites off a piece of its head, when suddenly it begins screaming in pain, wiggling out of his hands and tying a chain around the kid. He's lifted up the fireplace and that wakes everyone up. Sarah tries to pull his legs down while the entire family joins, but it's not enough. Sarah accidentally kicks a piece of firewood onto the gifts and they catch fire as the flames start to spread. Sarah freaks out and demands they pull her down, letting go of the kid's legs and Howard watches as his son is taken away. That makes two family members down with 10 more to go. Max puts out the fire while they try to figure out what the hell just happened and Howard here blames himself for the incident, telling his wife that he fell asleep while on guard duty. That's when the grandmother starts speaking in German, informing them that it's all their fault for this disaster, and a deadly monster is headed their way. She demands they listen carefully, and explains a story to the family. A long time ago on a night nearing Christmas, the mood was less cheerful than other years. As a child, she used Santa as a sign of hope, but the villagers began fighting amongst each other. She tried to help her parents with the spirit of giving, with no luck. Now she lost her spirit and caused a disaster in her village. That night, a blizzard covered the village, and now she knew that Santa Claus was not coming this year. Instead, the day deadly monster Krampus arrived, taking out the villagers one by one. The creature visited her house, but decided to spare her life, and it's clear to her that when the villagers stopped believing, the spirit of Christmas died on that day. Confused, Howard questions the legitimacy of her story. He storms out and demands to find his son. Pulling out a shotgun, he takes off the barricades and gets ready for the biggest mistake of his life. Outside, the spirits of Krampus appear at their front door. The family hears screams coming from the left and right, deciding to close the door for good. Max questions what to do next, with Tom ordering them to keep the fireplace lit. Meanwhile, Tom confronts his wife about the chimney incident. She insists that they find her daughter with no regard for their own safety. Lindy here finds a parcel and is about to open it up before her sister interrupts. The adults decide on what their plan of action is going to be and figure their only hope is to find the snowplow as long as it can make it through the intense blizzard. Tom plans to find the vehicle bringing it back while he clears a clear path for them to follow through. It's a risky idea, which they're soon going to regret. Okay, Grandma here has confirmed that something otherworldly is happening, and instead of getting to the bottom of it, the family has decided to ignore her and toss her horrifying tale of death and doom up to senile old ramblings. If it were me, I would do everything in my power to get to the bottom of why and how Krampus got here. Based on what Grandma has said about her own story, the Krampus beast came to get her family when the spirit of Christmas was lost, and people have stopped being nice and loving to one another. From this information, we can figure out two things. The first is that someone in the family might have made a terrible wish dooming us all to be killed by an evil Santa. The second is that it's our behavior that has created this problem. It's easy to figure out who would make the wish, since at dinner, these cousins have made it clear to everyone that Max is the only family member that's still hung up on Santa. He's also just beat up another boy for trying to ruin Christmas for the younger kids. It's safe to say reading his Christmas wishes out loud the night before was the final straw, so I would make Max write another letter wishing that Krampus would leave my family alone. I would also press Grandma to give me any other information she has found out about Krampus. It would be odd for a woman that lost her entire family to a mystical beast not to have done some research on the story. It's common knowledge that Krampus is similar to Santa in a lot of ways, and it's a folklore that predates Santa from the Alpine region. What's not commonly known about him is that similar to Santa, it was normal for people in those days to leave out an offering for him, but instead of milk and cookies, Krampus consumed schnapps and distilled fruit brandy. Since it's only December 24th, I would try to appease the beast by leaving out liquor, fruit, and any brandy I can find and make everyone be on their best behavior 24-7 to see if we can get Krampus to go away. If we leave out enough alcohol, it's possible that Krampus could become so drunk that he forgets the whole thing altogether. To be safe, I would also poison the liquor I gave him by lacing it with household items that can kill you if consumed, like drain cleaner. 
Sure, it's a nice idea to try and make peace with the beast, but he's already taken two family members, so it's better to be safe than sorry. Now, with all that said, we have to hand it to this creature. It was a stroke of genius that the Krampus only attacked them directly once they ran out of battery. This is huge because he knew what was capable. They would be able to take pictures of it, proving its existence. They might also be able to upload it to Facebook using their data to send the information, making it go viral. This would prove to the entire world that the supernatural is real, and it wouldn't take long for them to realize that this is the anti-Santa. Logically, if there's a supernatural anti-Santa, then it infers there must be a real Santa too. And billions of people across the world would have renewed faith. The Christmas spirit would have a revival like nobody has ever seen before, and it would leave Krampus here with almost nobody left to stock for their unbelief. With all of this said, this is exactly why these people should have been saving their phone batteries for when they needed it most. Keeping your battery devices sitting there doing nothing, except draining its precious battery, is a very stupid idea, especially if they already know there are beasts outside hunting them down. Getting evidence of the creature is going to be extremely important, especially if we are already seeing mysterious disappearances, wrecked cars, and demonic gingerbread cookies. It's not something I would want to mess with, and keeping your phone available when you need it most could make the biggest difference in saving your life or getting help. The family suspect that a mall could be a safe place to hide, with a nearby police station as plan B. Linda questions if anyone's out there, but they have limited time before the Krampus attacks again. Max here looks outside with his binoculars, spotting a strange figure in the distance. Upstairs, the cousins slowly pace through the hallway, and hear the voice of Beth from the attic, inviting them upstairs to show the kids something. Suddenly, the adults hear a scream from the attic, and the aunt tells them that some of the children went upstairs. Terrified, the parents go to look for their children, but that's when the other relatives hear a noise from another room. Howard readies his weapon just in case, and tells the others to wait while he goes to check it out. Up in the attic, the adults point their flashlights around the room, wondering where their kids ran off to, and Linda finds strange ornaments have been scattered around the place. Suddenly, the others spot this giant clown monster swallowing a kid, and Tom here fires off a few shots, scaring it off. That makes three family members down, with nine more to go. Downstairs, Howard peeks into the kitchen, tracking down what made the noise, but as he's searching for an intruder, the uncle is suddenly shot by these deadly gingerbread men. He manages to escape their attack and barely avoids getting killed. Acting quickly, he manages to take the gingerbread off of them, shooting the creatures one by one, and his dog saves him at the last second from certain death. In the attic, the others look around the room, finding this disgusting creature right above them. It attacks Sarah, pinning her to the ground, while they try to pull it off of her. Suddenly, an evil teddy bear attacks attacks Linda from behind, and she punches the horrifying animal, while Tom here is struck by a metal robot. The doll sticks its tongue out at Sarah, and wraps Christmas lights around her neck, using it to gruesomely strangle her. All hell has broken loose, and this is just the beginning of the worst night before Christmas in human history. Okay, the creatures are in the house, and the family has lost complete control over the one place. Thankfully, Krampus himself hasn't come inside the house, and now since everyone knows the grandma's terrifying Christmas story is real, they have no choice but to listen to the woman from here on out. If we remember earlier, the woman kept insisting that we keep the fire on, and at the time, it seemed like strange behavior. Everyone was trying to strategize how to keep the house safe, with barricades and shotguns, but all the woman wanted to do was keep feeding wood into the chimney. Since Krampus is basically the anti-Santa Claus, it makes sense that he would only be be able to enter the house through the chimney as well. So if it were me, I would make sure someone is guarding this fire at all points, even during the chaos. Now, this isn't going to be easy, because everyone is busy fighting off the entire island of misfit toys, and it's hard to focus with this much going on. Having said that, Howard here actually managed to kill some of them with his dog's help, and it gives us valuable information to work with. These gingerbread men are not the biggest threats in the house, but because they have all been either burned, shot, or eaten alive, we now know that these mystical creatures can in fact be physically killed. Instead of hiding from them anymore, I would go looking for the best possible ways we can think of to kill them. Since most of them are now in the house, I would run upstairs and try lighting the rest of these creatures on fire as well, because it continues to harm them. Since they're supernatural, it's fair to assume that these things won't die unless they're completely disintegrated, and getting burned to a crisp helps us achieve this the best. Now, it might seem counterintuitive to start wildly setting things on fire throughout your house, especially if it's the only place in the entire neighborhood where Krampus can't come down the chimney yet. It's an incredibly risky strategy, but the good news is that these are quite small creatures, and we already know there's a fire extinguisher in the house. As long as one of the family members takes it with them and puts out any fires to start spreading, we can control the situation and keep these creatures at a distance, taking them down as quickly as possible. Now at this point, we really need to start thinking about a plan B, because if we can't keep the house safe, we'll have no choice but to evacuate. The problem is that from what we've seen, anyone trying to escape hasn't made it very far down the street. This man was frozen to death, another car had its windshield punched through, and their own car was completely totaled and set on fire in the blink of an eye. Even if we could get another car working, 
it's likely that the entire street is blocked with other abandoned cars, and it means we need another mode of transportation. That's why if it were me, as a backup plan, I would make a bunch of Molotov cocktails, as well as gather any aerosol cans we have in the house. Then head to the garage and get out all the bicycles we have so that we can make a dash out of the area. If we're riding with someone standing on the back of the bike, then when a creature rushes towards us, we can light it on fire with an aerosol can or even throw a Molotov at it and keep pedaling until we've made it out. The longer we stay here, the less fortified our house becomes, and eventually the chimney fire will run out of wood, letting the Krampus inside. We just can't take that risk, and if we don't have a backup plan, then all hope is lost. Lindy here notices her son passed out beside her and takes a knife to the doll's eyeball. Throwing it off the railing, she grabs a hatchet and cuts the rope tied around her sister's neck. That's when she sees another creepy doll, demanding that it stay away from her son. Sarah brings her husband up to make sure he's okay, but the metal robot reappears, and Sarah shoots the contraption dead. They're interrupted by a scream from Max, rushing downstairs to see what's going on. Tom informs him that another kid has been taken away. They hear something struggling upstairs, and Sarah suggests that the monster is trying to get outside. Howard questions what's happened, readying a gun to go upstairs and find his son. Noticing the dog walk over to the vent, Max takes off the guard and lets the animal find the missing kid. Confused, they hear more screams from upstairs, hoping that the dog will take care of business. Suddenly, the roof begins to break as the screams quiet down. That's when the ceiling falls, and they find this disfigured clown staring right at them. Howard readies to shoot, but another creature flies down and pins the man. The family claws it off of him, now realizing that there are monsters around every corner. With a shotgun in hand, the auntie shoots the remaining creatures down without looking behind her. Elves pour through the window, and the family is overwhelmed. They put out the fire, while Linda notices that their baby daughter is being taken away. Chained up, and Dorothy is pulled away along with her, and Howard decides to join the group before being dragged outside into the blizzard. The monsters continue to surround them, when suddenly they hear a strange noise and run off in a panic state. Now half of the family has disappeared, and their hopes of surviving are slim to none. That makes six family members down, with six more to go. Okay, the monsters completely have the upper hand now. Not only did the family not use the opportunity of having the monsters in one place to take them down all at once, but the family is running for their lives in a frigid storm. They have very limited resources and no shelter to protect them from the cold or from Krampus. However, the most recent attack has revealed that there are elf creatures that are somewhat human-sized as a part of Krampus's army. It might seem terrifying, but this is actually great news because based on their size and the way they move, it wouldn't be hard to take them down as long as you had the resources to do it. We also need to be extremely organized and make sure the family is operating like a unit. If everyone is reacting to the situation individually, then it will be easy to get killed or taken. But if we support each other and stay focused as a team, we can do a lot more than think. This would be like 300 Christmas edition, except we're fighting a bunch of elves instead of Persians. But with a little bit of discipline, there's no reason we shouldn't be able to fight them off. Now, having said that, there are still kids in the group and these people don't have any combat experience other than killing gingerbread men. That's why it might also be useful to come up with a plan B here and make sure we have a different method to get what we want. That's why if it were me, in addition to collecting all the ammo I can find, I would look for any discarded clothing, masks, or Christmas items from the attack to dress my family in so we can blend in amongst the elves. For the most part, they're covered in tattered shrouds and don't speak, so as long as I can cover my face and only make squeaky noises, I should go undiscovered for a period of time until I can get close enough to Krampus and try to kill him when he least expects it. The elves and the other monsters are violent, but don't seem particularly smart. They are also using weapons like spears to threaten us, so as long as I have my gun and my identity is concealed, I should be able to outsmart them and kill any of them if they see through our disguise. A lot is unknown about the Christmas elves and other monsters. For example, where they are coming from and where they've been this whole time. If there's a location where all of them converge before going to attack us, we might be able to get there and take them out in an ambush. By going undercover with my family, not only will this hopefully protect us, but it might also buy us some time to learn more about our enemy so we can catch them off guard instead of constantly being at the mercy of their attacks. Tom insists that they make a break for it, heading for the snowplow with whatever ammunition they have left. Once they find somewhere safe, Tom will go after the monsters. He notices his mother trying to relight the fire, but orders her to leave now. That's when they hear a Christmas tune, taking their things and evacuating from the property. Tom tells them to stay together and walk outside to brave the storm. The grandmother stays behind, wishing them well and locking the door shut. Tom runs over, but it's too late. She's made up her mind and there's no way out. Hearing screams from every direction, he leads the family over to the snowplow. Meanwhile, the grandmother watches as their chimney collapses, revealing the terrifying Krampus. It slowly rises from below and stares her right in the face while walking towards the old lady. It takes a look at her, deciding not to attack. Suddenly, she looks inside the the creature to find a dozen deadly dolls. That makes seven family members down with five more to go. Outside, they brave the blizzard, finding light in the distance. Tom takes his weapon and orders everyone to head inside, safe from the monster.
monsters. He points the flashlight, watching as the invisible creature rushes towards him as he fires off shots. Looking behind, he gives the others a final warning, insisting they go now and drive as far as possible. Tom keeps firing in the direction of the invisible creature, but that was his biggest mistake. He's pulled into the snow and taken away by the creature. Moving along, they make it closer to the vehicle while Linda here is sucked into the snow, and Sarah takes her child away as she closes the door to help out her sister. That's when she feels the monsters attack and gets sucked into the snow as well. That makes 10 family members down with two more to go. Terrified, the boys realize that they need to leave now. Max tries to start up the snowplow, but the creatures surround them from every direction. Max watches as his cousin is taken away by another monster, but manages to push the other one off and sees it getting taken away. He decides to help out his cousin who begs him for help. Suddenly, the Krampus appears right in front of him. It drops his Christmas wish list on the ground, opening it to find a bell from Santa. Max wanders through the blizzard and hears the sound of his cousin calling out for him. He watches as these terrifying creatures torment the kid, calling out for their attention. Okay, Max here is the last man standing, and the only thing keeping him from becoming elf meat is that he's sitting in this car. Max wants to help save his family and his cousin, but instead of abandoning the one advantage he has left, Max should stay in the car. Max has difficulty starting the car, but that was made worse by the appearance of elves that try to kill him and suck his cousin into the snow. Now that they're gone, Max should do everything in his power to get the car started. He was already close, and once he has it started, he can use it to mow down as many elves as possible. By looking at where the elves are headed, he knows where he can find Krampus. He he should follow them to the centralized location where they all are and point his car straight at the head beast in charge. He probably only has one shot at killing him, so he should punch it and hope for the best. Once Max has Krampus killed or injured, he should try to use the car to kill whoever has his cousin. It would increase his chances of survival if he can kill whoever has one of his parents, since they have the best chance at protecting him after the fact. Krampus has also gifted Max with a bell from Santa. This could be just a token, or destroying it could be useful in reversing the worst Christmas present anyone has ever received ever. Regardless, he should take it and use it to bludgeon as many elves as he can and break it, seeing if its destruction brings about a reversal of fortune. Krampus paces towards him, and Max confesses that he takes back his wish, throwing the bell back towards the horde. Suddenly, the ground begins breaking apart, forming a volcanic hole in the middle. Max rushes to help his cousin before being confronted by the Krampus. Dropping his weapon, he pleads with the creature to return his family in exchange for himself, but the monster laughs at him and pushes his cousin to the never-ending abyss. That makes 11 family members down, with one more to go. Krampus grabs Max by the head while he begs for his life. He apologizes, admitting that he just wanted Christmas like in the old days. The Krampus drops him in towards his death, but that's when he wakes up back in his bed like nothing ever happened. Max looks out the window to see that the weather is clearing up. Confused, he notices that it's Christmas Day. The boy walks downstairs and finds the family wondering where he's been. Max sits down next to his parents, convinced that he had a bad dream. The grandmother walks over, wishing him a Merry Christmas. Now the nightmare is over, and they can finally enjoy the festive season. He opens up his gift to find the same bell that he threw at the Krampus. That's when the family looks at it in shock, remembering everything they suffered through, and realize that it was all real. They were punished for not having Christmas spirit, and granted a second chance to celebrate the holiday properly. It's a horrifying reminder to be thankful for what they have, and to make matters worse, the Krampus has been watching over them in his lair. The creature has several snow globes filled with the houses of different families it's visited, and if they ever slip up again, it'll come back to finish them off. But what do you think? How would you beat Krampus? Let me know with a comment down below. Thank you so much for watching, leave a like and subscribe, and check out the How To Beat playlist for more videos like this. Until next time, have a damn good day.